rabbinic scholar at Road of Shalom and also the rabbi in residence here at Calvary Church. We're very excited to offer this class with you. Uh, we've been scheming for a while, and I also, I've learned a lot about Jewish culture over the last few years. Uh, one thing I learned is Episcopalians and Jews have a lot of similarities and some differences, and a similarity is we get there right on time or right afterwards, seems to be the case often, so we'll let people come on in. Uh, we are recording these, so we'll have these online uh, available, so not streamed, but recorded. Aaron, would you lead us in prayer, please? So good morning. I'm delighted to be with you and to share this with, with Jonathan, the first of many opportunities I'm sure we'll have. We have a blessing that we say in Jewish community when we begin to study, and it's t described as the blessing over Torah study, and it makes reference to occupying ourselves with that work, but we'll understand it as engaging ourselves with study of meaningful texts. And the blessing is the following. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam asher kidshanu b'mitotav v'tzivanu la'asok b'divrei Torah. Blessed is the source of life in the universe who has sanctified us with commandments and encourages us and commands us to engage with texts of meaning. When I arrived in Pittsburgh eight and a half years ago, um, loved the city, loved the church immediately, but one person before any other minister, any priest, rabbi, pastor reached out to me, and that was Aaron Bisno. Uh, he offered hospitality, he emailed me, took me um, to a very good barbecue, by the way, places no longer there, across from the Mini Cooper dealer. Uh, wonderful place. He recognized me as a neighbor. And that initial act of hospitality always stuck with me. Uh, Aaron is indirectly responsible for why the Tree of Life came here after the shooting, their high holidays, because he opened a door, he lit a candle, he planted a seed that Calvary Church then reached out to the Tree of Life when they were in need and recognized them as neighbors. Now, it's our fervent hope that as we do this class that we will have many different types of people here. There'll be Jews and Christians and those who haven't figured it out yet and those who still aren't sure that we could recognize others as neighbors. How many people here are, if you don't mind identifying yourself, how many here are Jewish? Conservative? Reform? Reform? All reform? How many here are Christians, Episcopalians? Any, any other group? <laughs> Catholics? Lutherans? <laughs> Presbyterians sneaking in here? Great. <laughs> we even welcome the Presbyterians here. Uh, when we approach a Bible study, and this is something that I, I've learned, and I believe Aaron has learned this too, Lots of things that I just understood innately about my tradition, I would look at the Jewish tradition and say, oh my gosh, you think about that in a totally different way, or that's almost the same. And then we bring these presuppositions, these assumptions about how things are and how we understand the Bible, what it means, who the characters are, what they represent, how it's supposed to operate. And I believe you said you can know just enough to be dangerous, largely uh, to yourself. Now I know I bring presuppositions about who Jesus is, and one of the first things when I talked about, do you want to do a class about the parables of Jesus? What is the reaction that you had? What are the parables of Jesus? So I assumed that the parables of Jesus, although I was familiar with them as a category of, of biblical literature, were stories about Jesus. That is a stories about his own life, stories we would tell or you would share about the young Jesus the adolescent, the middle-aged man, what it was. Um, but in point of fact, when I shared that question... No, that's, they're not about Jesus. They're stories <laughs> told by Jesus. Huh. And lots of those things we want to learn together to challenge one another, not, not in a bad way, but to grow more deeply into our faith, challenge all those presuppositions. There are many things we learn over time simply by being together uh, with one another, that will completely confound an outsider. For example, Aaron, what is Rosh Hanukkah anyway? Right, so Rosh Hashanah. Oh, right, sorry. Right, is the, the, 
the Jewish New Year, and Hanukkah is the holiday we observe in December, and we'll talk about that in a, another month's time. That's right. One of the first questions Aaron asked me, this was on the sly, because you never want to be dumb when you're a minister asking another minister a religious question. Why do you scratch your head sometimes during the service? Like, what do you mean scratch? Then I realized, before the gospel, we make the sign of the cross. God be in my head, God be in my words or mouth, God be in my heart. But if you don't know, because you don't do it right, you just go, go like this really quickly, <laughs> it kind of looks like I'm scratching my head each time. And I was like, Aaron, what's that thing that Jews wear on their head? The, uh, the kippah. The kippah, right. Right, the, uh, the yarmulke, the, the head cover the traditional Jews wear. That's right. That, that was a joke we just missed the timing of right there. Yeah. It's supposed to be a hat. A hat. That's, that's right. right. Uh, we share many things in common, like a sense of humor and a lot of values like love and justice and mercy and doing good works. But here's one fundamental difference. I believe Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Do you? I don't believe You don't Christ believe is. that. Uh, I should say Aaron, my friend, does not believe that. And here is a main Point I want everybody to hear that I am not trying to convert you to be a Christian. Aaron, are you trying to convert me to be a Jew? I'm not interested in converting you or anyone else to being a Jew. <laughs> but what we both hope is that everybody here is converted more deeply to his or her own faith. So, and this is not a least common denominator thing like Let's just figure out what we can all agree on and settle on that. N no, not at all. I mean, if you're Jewish, be the best, most faithful Jew that you can possibly be. And if this class can help you do that, great. And if you're a Christian, an Episcopalian, be the best, most faithful Christian Episcopalian that you can be and that we learn from one another in our tradition. Now, we realized early on something happened. I taught a class in the same spot for about five years, and it was attended with about 25 people, and Aaron's taught many times. But we learned pretty quickly when we talked to people about this, one plus one doesn't equal two in a class like this. If you put a priest and a rabbi and Jews and Christians together, it suddenly becomes something much more than that in almost inexplicable way. And so that's what we're trying to do together, is create something more than the sum of its parts. And I wanted to teach a class with my friend, and I'm the priest, and he's the rabbi, so we can do that type of thing. This class will be different, and I would say that maybe we'll get to the parable today, maybe not. <laughs> All your questions are welcome. Please don't feel embarrassed if you ask something that you think everybody should know. That's okay. That's what we want to do. On a normal class, we'll have a time that we'll pray aloud, that we'll read the parable aloud, and they're grouped in a, a sensible order, and then we'll have a chance to talk about them and discuss them. Uh, we'll do this through the rest of the semester, so to speak, till December 18th. December 18th is the last class of the semester, and on that day, we will talk about the Good Samaritan, which is my favorite parable, and then after the service, after 10 o'clock after this class, at 11 o'clock is the Calvary Christmas pageant. And that's where we tell the story of the birth of Jesus. And we do it in a big, th if you're Jewish, think Purim Spiel. It's a campy way of telling the story with lots of kids. And we have a camel, a real life, like as big as a horse camel, <laughs> donkey, sheep, goats. And Rabbi Myers from Tree of Life, I wrote him into the script as Moses. Generally, he's not in there, but he came as Moses. He'll come as Moses. Maybe we can get Moses and Aaron in the Christmas pageant, for example. <laughs> that one was way too easy. <laughs> but on after that is a petting zoo if you want to meet a camel in person. And then <laughs> December 18th in the evening, anyway, is Hanukkah. So Tree of Life will host a Hanukkah party in the parashal, all one collective thing. And again, it's to learn and enjoy being together as various communities and all neighbors here. How many books are in the Bible, Aaron? Well, in the Jewish Bible, <laughs> in the Jewish Bible there are 39. Which, what do you call the Jewish Bible? So, let me, shameless plug, 
as in November, we're going to start a class, three sessions in November and three in December. I'm calling Back to the Sources, which will be a sort of a larger overview of Jewish sacred literature generally. But the Jewish Bible, which you know as the Old Testament, those are synonyms, is comprised of the Torah, the first five books, and the Hebrew prophets, and then the collections we call the writings, which include Proverbs and Psalms and Ecclesiastes and th that collection. I thought you were just going to call it the Bible. Oh, the Bible. We refer, just, to as the, yeah. we refer to the Bible. There's a Hebrew acronym called Tanakh, but it's the Bible. When we refer to the Bible, we're referring to what you know as the Old Testament. How many do Christians have the same Bible as the Jewish tradition? The, it's, yeah, it's more than, it's like the first three quarters. <laughs> the, the Bible, the Jewish Bible, those 39 books, that's what we call the Old Testament. Those are the same. But what else do we have in addition to that? The New Testament. Now, how many people know how many books are in the New Testament? Not in, oh, clever. Not including the Apocrypha. 27. And those are four Gospels. There are lots of epistles or letters. Uh, there's also a Revelation, which is a type of apocalypse roughly similar to uh, the book of Daniel. Old Testament, or the Bible, is in Hebrew, and the New Testament is mostly in Greek with a tiny bit of Aramaic. Now, here is a very large loaded question we could spend years talking about. When we're talking about the parables of Jesus, there is a giant elephant in the room, cosmic in scale, who is or who was Jesus. Oh, met by silence. So when we're talking about this guy, who are we talking about? The Son of God is one way to talk about it. A marginal Jew is another way to talk about it. A bridge that leads from the Old Testament to the New. By the way, when you ask questions or say stuff, I'll repeat it, or Aaron will, so it's recorded. Everybody can hear. Uh, okay, yes. What does the name Jesus mean? Anybody know? Yahweh is salvation. Where, when was he born? Approximately. On Christmas Day, on the year zero? Probably not but about 2,000 years ago. Most likely, his, his earthly father, Joseph, was a, a carpenter or a stonemason, so he probably learned that. His mother, Mary, was from Nazareth, and Luke, the gospel, records her uh, as having a cousin named Elizabeth, and whose husband, Zechariah, was a priest in the lineage of Aaron and the tribe of Levi. And they were a very faithful, in their time, Jewish family living in the Near East. Uh, they were in Bethlehem where his father was from. Now I'm not going to get into Jesus as the Son of God or virgin birth or sin or miracles or huge, huge pieces here, but for our purposes to say Jesus is, was very Jewish. Anybody know what his last name is, Jesus' last name? Ben Yosef, that is probably the most accurate name. What do, ben Yosef, what does that mean? Son of Joseph. Jen's son, like son of Jen. Uh, most likely true. His name is not, last name is not Christ, and his middle initial is not H, so it's not Jesus H. He, Jesus Henry Christ, there it's been revealed. Uh, Jesus Christ, Christ means in Greek the anointed one. And that's the Greek word for the Hebrew word of, anybody take a guess what Christ is anointed? Messiah. So Messiah is a Hebrew Jewish idea. Christ, the anointed one, is a Greek idea. And those two things are not exactly the same, but very, very close. The Gospels, that is Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, are the stories about Jesus' life, his parables, his teachings, and so on. And they do give some details of his early life, and what we tend to do is conflate those. For example, Luke, the gospel, tells the, the Christmas story most people know about. And then only Matthew has the Magi or wise men. So those are not in the same gospel, but we usually 
stick them together as one larger uh, continuous story. We know about his birth, his circumcision, presentation of the temple, running off to Egypt because Herod wanted to kill him, visit to the temple at age 12, and then the Bible is silent. The Gospels are silent on him. Then it picks up again about age 30, and so we have no idea what happened from roughly age 12 to 30. But that's where he begins his teaching ministry. Before all the parables, he calls his disciples or students, and they call them rabbi. What does rabbi mean? Oh, excellent. Everybody <laughs> knew that. Rabbi <laughs> means teacher. We know in the story, for, this is for everybody, again, conflating all the, the images together, he was, when he started his public ministry, he was baptized by John the Baptist in the wilderness. He faced temptation, and he gathers his followers and starts this teaching ministry, doing miracles, and they kind of scale up. His first one in John is, uh, and the preacher today does a wonderful job talking about miracles. He turns, this is the Episcopalian's favorite thing, he turns water into wine, but by the end, he's resurrected from the dead, so it has a, a progression there. Most of his ministry was spent where? Most of his life was spent where? Particularly all of his adult life. Galilee. Where's Galilee? Northern part of Israel. And so pretty much all of his ministry that we read about in the Bible, all these parables are in Galilee, and just north of there would be a Gentile area starting, and then down south of there to Jerusalem, but mostly in Galilee, like his teaching, his parables and miracles and so on. Um, He's in the tradition of Jewish rabbis of that first century. What would that have been typical for a rabbi at that time, Aaron? What would he do? Would there have been women as rabbis? There would not have been women as rabbis, and we should just note historically that's a bit of an anachronism. The term rabbi was used, and Jesus was understood as a rabbi, but rabbi as we understand it didn't actually come into being that role until after the year 70, right? So, and Jesus, if we allow that, lived 33 years before being crucified at 33, the year 70, the temple in Jerusalem that Herod, uh, they destroy, and after that, the priesthood can no longer bring sacrifices to the temple in Jerusalem, and the priesthood is replaced by the rabbinate. That is to say, those scholars or those teachers who now preserve the Torah absent the ability to make sacrifices and study in prayer. It's a a major development in the first century in Judaism. Study in prayer replaced sacrifice as the way in which we communicate with God. So Jesus would have been known perhaps as a rabbi, perhaps as a bit anachronistically as his, his life and life's work is remembered, but they would have been involved in teaching the texts and the lessons that would bring you closer connection to what God wants of you. So he wasn't the only show in town. He's walking around. He's also in the prophetic tradition. Uh, Elijah, Elisha, Isaiah, and so on, of using the scriptures. And again, when, he, when Jesus quotes scriptures, what is he quoting? the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, or what Christians would call the Old Testament. And it is filled, the Gospels, with him quoting. And his, if you have to think about it, wherever you grew up shapes your imagination. And Jesus grew up in that time in what is now modern-day Israel, and so he's immersed in the stories of the Bible. He would have known about big city, relative big city life, the temple, and the sacrifices there in Jerusalem being the kind of the cultural and religious and economic capital of that area, he would have known about those things. And so his whole mind and faith and imagination is shaped in his Jewish roots. Now you could say that he, all of us grow past our initial roots, but that's really the core understanding of who he is. What was his main message when he taught all throughout the Gospels? It was one thing, it has often been said that a preacher has one sermon, he or she just keeps giving it in different ways, maybe, but he has one consistent message, and it starts, now it's like saying, how did Mozart start? Well, he was good for his age, but you get better at stuff. 
artists, athletes, scholars, everybody in what you do, you get better, I hope, over time. And so the parable that we'll get to here in a little bit, the sower, is his, one of his first, rather, it is the first recorded attempt or go at that. But what was his subject over and over and over? It was almost always different ways of talking about the same thing. The kingdom of God, which is Matthew, uh, sorry, Mark and Luke, and Matthew is the kingdom of heaven, but it's the same thing. He talked about the kingdom of God all the time. So every parable is indirectly or directly about the kingdom of God. It could also be about the nature of God revealed, but those are not synonymous, but, but closely related. So what in the world, and where does Jesus define what the kingdom of God is? Excellent answer, because he never defines what it is. <laughs> it's like, oh my, please. Could you just make a list and we know what to do or what to think? But he doesn't do that. Instead, he tells stories. Uh, a really basic thing, I preached a couple weeks ago <coughs> and told a story about 25 years ago this happened, and the punchline was I had a full cup of coffee thrown right into my face. And Tom said, I think you've told that story before. I remember it. Well, I did tell that story before, but it's a good story, and it bears <laughs> repeating every once in a while. Have you never told the same story to your kids or a family member? Because it's a good story. But the key point is, I preached for eight and a half years, all this really clever and insightful and holy stuff, Tom or no one else remembers one thing I said. <laughs> but you know, be nice, love each other, be a good neighbor, etc. But if you tell a story, it sticks with you in a different way. What is compelling, what is memorable, what is persuasive? And so Jesus told stories. Now there's other teachings and quoting scriptures and so on. But uh, Aaron and I were talking this morning about the Ten Commandments. Now that is quite literally a list of ten things you should do or ought not to do, but what's the context for that? The context is, if you picture the, the scene, arriving at Mount Sinai, going up the mountain, 40 days, 40 nights, coming down with the tablets, breaking the tablets, going up again, right? It's the Ten Commandments themselves are embedded in a story, which I suggest, I'll hazard a guess, that if you were now to recall the story and recall each of the Ten Commandments, you might have an easier time recalling the story than those ten enumerated instructions. The power of narrative being, being what it is. So, you could say because Jesus was a good teacher, that's why he told stories. So what is this kingdom of God? What is the kingdom of heaven? Does the patriarchal nature of the term strike you as funny or offensive? If it does, the word is basileia, which means the reign. So the reign of God is another way to think of that. It's not a place. Kingdom of heaven is the creation restored as God intends it. God's dream or vision for the world. It is the covenant of, of Israel lived into. It is the commandments followed and obeyed Faithfully. Isn't that called the messianic age? Yeah, so if you will, the question is, isn't that called the messianic age? In Judaism, the idea, and there is a, a thread that, that runs through traditional Judaism of waiting for the Messiah or expecting the Messiah. And the joke has always been whether, the, whether you we're waiting for the Messiah to show up or to return, right? Sort of a Jewish or Christian riddle about that. And the joke is, well, we'll ask Jesus or we'll ask the Messiah when they arrive, if they've been here before, or whether they're for the first time. <laughs> but for contemporary Jews, for liberal Jews, the idea of waiting for a personal Messiah isn't quite consonant with the way in which we understand the world, so we bespeak a messianic age, which is essentially, I suspect, not unlike the kingdom of heaven or the reign of God on earth. That is like to create here the conditions that we would expect a Messiah would either anticipate or bring about that that's our responsibility to do here. So that's exactly right. That would be the Jewish reference to the kingdom of God may well be the Messianic age, or we would have a, a rich discussion if we were to compare and contrast. 
That to. is a wonderful point, and say for the sake of discussion, yes, that's the best way to think about it. Um, and so Jesus is giving a traditional approach of what that looks like, but also offering some twist. It's not exactly as we might expect. That's part of his message. It's not something you can pin down, because where is this kingdom of God? Where is the Messianic age? It's in the future. There's this really quirky phrase I happen to like. It's the already, but not yet. What? Just let it sink in a little bit. The already, but not yet. The kingdom of God is within you, and at the same time, it is infinitely beyond you. Jesus will talk about these two ways. It's in-breaking, it's coming in, and yet it's already here. And so part of it, following in on that talk, would be preparing yourself, making yourself open by your faithful obedience to the commandments, would be more of a Jewish approach, to welcome that messianic age. That's what he's talking about consistently over time. It changes a little bit, but again, think of every parable with at least that context in mind. And why do you think he would come up with this idea that sounds amazingly similar to the Messianic age? Because that's what he knew. Call it a new thing, but you're giving it a different interpretation, but it, that's, it's coming from those uh, roots. Parables gives us, give us a glimpse into that. So what does the word parable mean? It's a story with, with the moral. Now I would say don't get lost, don't miss the forest for the trees. So how is, particularly this first one, a parable different than an allegory? Or is it also, in some cases, could it be a fable, talking animals, or a, a simile, or a metaphor, or just a moral tale? It, it sometimes isn't helpful to get too caught up in all that. Parable, uh, para means alongside or next to, and balo means to throw, so to cast alongside of. So we take a simple idea, compare it to something else, you move from simple to more complicated. We begin to understand, oh, I understand this, therefore I must have some idea what this other more complex thing is. How many, uh, they're memorable teaching aids. It's much easier again to remember a story than a bunch of, uh, a list of things. How many parables are there in the New Testament? Depends on how you count. 30 or 40. Some of them are like one-liners. The one that the uh, parable of the sower will get to is the longest one. It's the only one with a full explanation. So that effect is a model for others. Uh, where are the parables found? Now, the Christians better know this one. <laughs> or we're going to have some serious Bible 101 classes here. Where are the parables found? Oh, you're three quarters right. So they're in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but not John. Is, are there any parables in the book of John, Gospel of John? Apparently not. <laughs> That's scolding, no, there are none in the Gospel of John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So here's something, a presupposition. What in the world are the Gospels? That means good news. Okay. Uh, it means good news. There are, they're not biographies of Jesus. They're, they're a collection of stories about Jesus which include a little bit of history, not, not history as we'd write it today, but a narrative about somebody's life. They're meant to be persuasive, so you make a decision of who Jesus is. They include teaching, and roughly a third of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are parables. Other teaching, Jesus said, do this. Lots of healing stories. He healed the widow, he did this, he did that, and other miracle stories. And then there's a, a consistent narrative. He's moving from small town, gathering his disciples, teaching throughout Galilee, and then eventually he moves, the, the idea is moving towards Jerusalem, which is the crucifixion judgment. All those things are happening, but all of that within the context of the Gospels 
is telling the story about what the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is. Um, some parables appear in all four Gospels. That's why, why did we chose, why did Aaron and I, who am I kidding, why did I choose the parable of the sower today? <laughs> I'm talking more because I know a little bit more about this, I hope, than Aaron, but we'll share. It's faint more, praise. Faint <laughs> praise, thank you. Uh, sometimes he'll talk more, sometimes I'll talk more, it just depends. Um, parable of the sower appears in all four Gospels. It's also the longest one, and it gives the model for looking at all the others. By the way, who wrote the four Gospels? We don't know at all, really, other than what they say about themselves. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, I, I could, there's so many things I'd love to say. There's symbols of those four Gospel writers all over the church, um, but we don't know anything about them. We use those names for convenience. So, final point, all parables are ultimately about the kingdom of God, and they are descriptive rather than prescriptive. What do I mean by that? They're not telling you what to do. These are more Jesus describing the way the world is, the way the kingdom works. Not, you've been a naughty boy or girl, but this is how God wills the world and creation to be, and they are supposed to evoke or challenge or elicit a response. It's not just, oh, that's a nice story, neat. They want you, Jesus wants you to wrestle with it. So there are sometimes multiple layers. How would you describe this, Aaron? So I was sharing with Jonathan earlier that Moses Maimonides in the 12th century was considered the greatest Jewish philosopher of the Middle Ages. In fact, he just described as, there's a phrase that says, from Moses, meaning Moses in the Bible, to Moses, meaning Moses Maimonides in the 12th century, there was no one like Moses. So Moses Maimonides was considered the philosopher par excellence. And he's the one who introduces the idea that the Bible, for our purposes, in this case, the parables of the New Testament, but the Bible is understood or should be understood to be uh, communication from God that is appreciated on multiple levels. He uses the word pardes. Pardes means orchard in Hebrew, but it's the word that gives us paradise. So appreciate that it's spelled in Hebrew with four letters. For our purposes, P-R-D-S. Pardes, paradise. And he uses each one of those letters as an acronym, or he uses the four letters to make an acronym that represents the following. The P is called Peshat. It means just the surface level. So take the story of Adam and Eve in the garden, and it's about two individuals, a talking snake and an apple in a tree, and we all can appreciate the story just on that level, and that's how a child would appreciate the story. We learn the characters. But it hints at something else, because most snakes that we encounter don't talk. And so the second level is the remez, that there's a hint of something more going on there, right? And so the more insightful, the more mature reader or listener will sense that there's something else going on. The story has a purpose besides simply describing a man named Adam and a woman named Eve and an apple tree in a garden. And then the next level is called drash, which we, from which we get the word midrash, which we'll talk about in another session or time, which is a sense of wanting to explicate what's going on there. That is to say, the fact that the woman offered the man the apple or the fact that they responded to each other in this way gives us an opportunity to fill in the story or to ask deeper Questions And again, the more insightful student or the more educated or uh, mature, faithfully mature person will get a sense that there's something there that, re that calls on them for something. And the third level is referred to as sod, which is the Hebrew word for secret, which Maimonides, who was described, or we could describe as, well, let me back up. I heard a lecture one time at Harvard by the uh, anthropology professor Stephen Jay Gould. You know the name Stephen Jay Gould? He was introduced by the speaker who introduced him as the eminently arrogant Stephen Jay Gould. <laughs> and Moses Maimonides could similarly be so described. And he believed that only he and a few other of his contemporaries understood the secret, deepest level in which the Torah or the Bible was explained. But the idea is that the stories that we come across in the Bible, according to the Jewish uh, frame of reference, 
can be understood on multiple levels. And if you're fortunate and if you're industrious and put the time in, you'll begin to go deeper into that text. And the parables certainly operate on those kinds of uh, depths of levels. Can I answer the question? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I, we're done. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, <laughs> those levels, remember, again, Jesus was a Jewish teacher. That was much later that that idea was developed. But parables, he understood, are multivalent, polyvalent. They operate at multiple levels at the same time. What I find, and I'm guessing it's similar within Judaism, sometimes people take a story or religion at that surface level. Ah, I don't agree with that. It's stupid. That doesn't agree with science. And I believe in dinosaurs. And I just reject all of that. Well, that's a silly way to look at it. It's fine if you're a child, but not if you're an adult. And those other levels, a parable is operating in a similar way. Religion operates in a similar way with these different levels. We would say, by the way, the, the fourth or highest is not secret. We talk about the term of a mystery. Jesus uses that term. Mysteries are not something, you, you, a secret you can't unravel, but a world in which you participate. The messianic age, the kingdom of God. But it takes a lot of time of working with and through and among all those levels to begin to get to that. But Jonathan, if I could, both Please. secrets and mysteries, though they're different. My son used to have, um, when he was little, trouble between, to understand the difference between teasing or a joke and a lie. They're, they're, they're related, aren't they? Right? They're playing with the nation of truth or veracity or expectations. The same is true uh, in this case. That is to say that, um, that there are more things going on at, at one time. Yeah. Mystery and secret both have something that's with hidden, right? Or something that you have to search for or seek to understand and may never realize, but the search itself or the activity of asking the question or engaging in the, in the search is the activity that a mystery or a secret calls upon for you, right? That's sort of if you would, what you said to me earlier about the parables approaching at different points in your life or even a different day. Ah, so in the same way then for as a parable can be understood at different levels or you understand it at different times in your life at different, in, in different ways, so too are we changing. Well, I can say that, I guess. The same way that the parable can be understood differently and we change. Do you remember the, the Greek philosopher Heraclitus who said that you can never step into the same river twice because the river is different and you're different. And it will appear to you that it's the same river. You've forded this river before. You've seen this parable before. But the reflective person understands and appreciates that the text is changing, at least from what it originally meant or what it is now or the translation you have, or in this gospel versus that gospel. And we are each ourselves different each time we approach it. Yeah, and remember we said that this parable, parable of the sower, appears in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's really similar, but there are a few differences there. Uh, the preacher today mentions the game telephone. So I told Aaron, Aaron told his son, and his son told, and he gets back, is like, what are you talking about? These stories come from an oral culture. They were writing things down, but if you grow up where you're telling the stories over and over and pass them down, there's a greater sense of memorization, quite frankly, but of a shared cultural understanding and transmission or passing down of these stories. There are some differences, but there are really striking similarities uh, that exist there. I think what we'll do is introduce this parable and then be able to record the rest. But what uh, questions do we, before we start that? Well, Any questions? Yes. Say that all history is subjective. Well, Stories can be embellished, what we have is written down, and there are layers to it. And remember, there are also interpretive layers over time. When I approached these stories, I, had to, I realized I had blinders on, and probably Aaron does too in a different way, because I just, well, I know that. That's obviously what the scholars have said. And then it caused me to start thinking about it differently, having a very different voice, and I hope the, the same for you. Um, the pair, by the way... This doesn't have a name in the Bible, but we call the story the parable of the sower. Um, would you like to read this? Sure. The, 
from Luke chapter 8. When a great crowd gathered and people from town after town came to him, he said in a parable, A sower went out to, seed, to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell on the path and was trampled on, and the birds of the air ate it up. Some fell on the rock, and as it grew up, it withered for lack of moisture. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew with it and choked it. Some fell into good soil, and when it grew, it produced a hundredfold. As he said this, he called out, let anyone with ears to hear listen. Then his disciples asked him what this parable meant. He said, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, but to others I speak in parables, so that looking they may not perceive and listening they may not understand. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. The ones on the path are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. The ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy. But these have no root. They believe only for a while and in time of testing fall away. As for what fell among the thorns, these are the ones who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life and their fruit does not mature. But as for that in the good soil... These are the ones who, when they hear the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patient endurance. You all understood that perfectly so we can stop, right? <laughs> who, to whom did Jesus tell that story? Did you catch it? You have, most of you have it in front of you. To the crowds. So in the Bible, the Gospels in particular say crowds. What does that mean? The rabble, big groups of people, men and women. It really represents everybody. At that particular time, it was mostly Jewish, most likely. But all three Gospels, again, carry this same story. And they all have uh, the stories told, then there's an interpretation of it or sorry, Jesus asks, the disciples ask, what does that mean? And then there's an interpretation of it. Who asked for the interpretation? To whom does he give the interpretation? The disciples. The crowds just left to wonder what in the world does that mean? How many disciples are there? Twelve. Why do you suppose there are twelve? Is that a totally random number of disciples? How many tribes of Israel are there, Aaron, historically? Twelve. Twelve. So the twelve disciples, historically understood to represent the twelve tribes of Israel, that is everybody. So, yeah, it's only twelve, but this is meant to be representative of all of God's people are following Jesus at this point. And by the way, I love the disciples. They are unbelievably dense and stupid. <laughs> in the Gospels, and you're just like, guys, come on, I, I'm spoon-feeding it to you here, and you don't get what I'm saying. And the frustration, I mean, these are, you know, it's not the first time either. Uh, well, hey, good, see you later, crowds. Jesus, what in the world are you talking about? So he gives this very allegorical kind of one-to-one -one interpretation there. Um, Again, this is meant to be descriptive rather than prescriptive. Jesus told the story, the crowd gathered, he gave the, the example. And so is this some farming anecdote or what is he really talking about? What are most of his parables about? The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. And what is the sower so, sowing? What's he, the farmer putting out? The seed What's the, the story says, what is the seed? The word of God. Who can tell me, Jew, Christian, Presbyterian, what, Catholic, <laughs> what is the word of God? Because if you don't know what that is, it gets like, what's he talking about here? B yes, it means something specific and something more general. The word of God is the Bible. The commandments, the, the mitzvah, the commandments, the power and presence of God. How did the creation come into being? 
God spoke the creation into existence. So the word of God ushers forth and creates all that is known. And so that word of God, it means all these things. To the Christian, the word of God also means something very specific. Not a what, but who is the word of God. Jesus is the low, in the Gospel of John, is the logos, the word of God. And so that's operating at all these different levels there. And again, the story isn't just simple, straight line, but has these different ways of understanding it. Now, why do you always talk in riddles, Jesus? Why can't you just tell us plainly what you mean? I don't know. I wish he would. <laughs> Give me a straight answer sometimes. Jesus said to the disciples, To you is given the secrets or mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others I speak to disciples, or sorry, in parables. That is, the disciples have observed Jesus. They've watched his healing. They, they were obviously with him when he called them. He's, they've seen him up close over time. And presumably, uh, when you're with people a lot, you talk about lots of things. For example, yesterday we had this big Ethiopian celebration. They lit a bonfire. It's a symbolic search for the true cross. There are 50 people in traditional robes processing around the, the fire, dancing and singing, and it took forever. And then we, Natalie, my wife and I, went to dinner at their house, and it was wonderful, but it was like six hours. And in that time, all these side conversations happened. And we learned all these things about people that aren't in the official logbook or guidebook. And that's happening with Jesus and the disciples all the time. When you're together, you know, Aaron and I worked out this presentation, but we just talk about stuff all the time, like you do with your friends and family. So if anybody ought to get it, they should have. Guys, you already know the secrets because you're with me all the time. It's everything we always talk about, but to everybody else we have to talk in parables. In the previous chapter, Jesus was compared to two famous Old Testament Hebrew prophets. Anybody know this gospel well enough? Who is Jesus compared to? Elijah and Elisha. So kind of teacher, student. Uh, what, who were they? Who were Elijah and Elisha? Were they minor, second-rate prophets? They were not. They were not second-rate prophets. <laughs> Who, who well, are we think of Elijah in Jewish tradition as the one who will be the harbinger of the Messiah. So if you've been, for instance, to a Passover Seder, we, open the, we leave a cup for Elijah, we open the door for Elijah, Elijah doesn't show up, so we're still waiting. Um, at a circumcision, the Elijah's chair is the chair in which often the, the grandfather, one who's holding the baby, or at least an, a chair, a, an honorary chair to sit in, Elijah is... The prophet that, if there's a bridge uh, between the Old and the New Testament, is the bridge between this world and the next. So all before this, Jesus was compared to Elijah and Elisha. He is like that great prophet from that tradition. And then he drops, it's a paraphrase, not a quote. After he tells the story, and interprets it, to, uh, referring to the crowds, looking they may not perceive and seeing they may not understand. Anybody know where that comes from? From Jesus the Jew? It's from Isaiah. And it falls in this, uh, after Isaiah has a seraph, an angel, take a hot coal and touch his mouth which, with it, which is symbolically purifies him to go out and proclaim wisdom to the people. So this is not meant as a judgment on the people. It's simply, again, rather a description of the way things are. It's a sad state of things. Because no matter what I do, you don't seem to get it. Uh, prophets and their message were often rejected, so Jesus is kind of planning ahead. Uh, I can tell you all this great wisdom, but you guys are just going to reject it. He uses Isaiah. What I would say is, where I'm from, well, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. That's basically what Jesus is saying there. Um, now, the, the interpretation... There's a question. Is this parable about parables? Brilliant question. Why do you say that? Yes. Every, sometimes it hits, sometimes it doesn't. 
This parable, why I chose it, is because this is the key interpreted parable for all the others. To help us understand, and Jesus intended it that way, to begin thinking about all the parables that follow, which are about the kingdom and some of these also agrarian themes, to begin, oh my God, that's not just singular, A means B and B means, and so it's multivalent, polyvalent, operating at different levels, it's challenging, it's evocative, it taps into Jewish history. Oh my gosh, it takes so much work. Can't you give us, how do I, just tell me, how, how can I get into heaven? That's all I need to know, really. <laughs> how do I get saved? What's the, there are other stories like, oh, I've done all the commandments, Jesus, that's just exhausting, but tell me, like, what's the, the easiest thing I can do? Just give me the executive summary of everything I'm supposed to do, and I'll do that. And Jesus says, uh, no, no. You got, how many commandments are there? 613. 613. Follow all those and you're good. It's like, <laughs> can, 10? How about 10? That's much, much better. This is operating in a very similar way. This is a parable about parables and how we approach them, which are, again, about the kingdom of God, the messianic age, in breaking into this world. So if you could begin to understand this, you'll see what Jesus is talking about. Uh, I'll, we'll leave it there and then record the rest of it, which is not that long. But what questions do you have before we go today? Class two through the rest will be much more interactive by design. Go ahead. Where does the custom of baptism come from? Is there any? Well, so the, the, the question about baptism, which we can, we can talk about more after the class, but the mikvah, right, the ritual bath, of a, which is for purification purposes, is likely that which became incorporated into the idea. Every religious tradition uses water in some means, right? And fire as a symbol, and bread as a symbol. And, and so the idea of water as purification was familiar then, and mikvah was a ritual that... I don't think the men go into But they do. But they do. Yeah. Great question. A lot of uh, Christian worship, in particular, and beliefs of course, are variations on a Jewish idea. Or some, they look the same, but they're not, or they are the same, and in fact, look the same. That's, uh, we've taken baptism to mean something different over time, but it was ritual purification. Jesus was baptized, by the way, at the start of his public ministry. Great question. What other questions? Susie? Great question. Was the crowd accustomed to being taught by parables? Did Jesus invent parables? No. <laughs> Negative. He did not. Smart guy, but did not invent parables. Are there any parables in the Old Testament? Yes. There are. You, Please. Uh, you and me? Okay. Yeah. Uh, this is more your area than mine, but sure. Uh, <clears throat> Nathan and David, when Nathan the prophet confronts David, you've, uh, he tells a story about two men in a certain city, one rich, one poor. The rich man had many flocks, stole the poor flock. Oh, that's a terrible thing. You're that man by stealing the woman. There are parables that exist in the Old Testament scriptures. Jesus took that to a whole, a whole other level. That was his, you could say, primary teaching method. So people were familiar with the idea. Uh, pretty much everywhere, I'm sure, people have been used to storytelling and using a story to illustrate a point. A parable is just a particular way of, of doing that. If I could. Uh, very briefly, if you, there's this old saying called bread and circus. If Jesus is reigning uh, 
making water into wine and feeding, multiplying food and healing your sick kid. I mean, you'd pay attention to that guy, wouldn't you? I'll put up with this teaching nonsense if I'm going to get something good out of it. Aaron? If I could, I just want to echo because it made, made your answer about uh, Nathan and Daniel made me think that in the Old Testament, in the, in the Jewish Bible, there are many stories about sharing dreams that then are interpreted. And arguably, I'm thinking about it for the first time, that sharing a dream that has a meaning, which is what we want to read into our dreams, or Freud taught us is available to us, yes, that, that those ideas are also. So whether it's about seven sickly cows, and that's about a famine, and seven fat cows about a feast, right, or whether it's about a ladder to heaven, or these dreams are arguably in the par parabolic tradition, right? There are also stories that are intended to take you beyond the actual details, but into some other realm, right? Any last questions? Thank you all very much. Awesome. Well done. Really good. You too. Wow.